to a discussion of energy security, which is obviously another very critical set of issues on the international agenda. Uh, and we're very pleased to have Silke Temple with us, um, who is the editor-in-chief of International Politique uh, and an old friend of GMF. But before we invite Silke to come out and our panel, we're going to play a short video for you. Significant developments for U.S. and European energy are taking place outside the Atlantic region. With regulatory, political, and market uncertainties at play, the new global energy order could bring transatlantic partners closer together or push them apart. The low price of oil and shift in Chinese demand have changed the game. Europe and Asia now pay nearly the same price for natural gas, which could benefit Europe as it seeks to reduce dependence on Russian gas. U.S. companies, on the other hand, had planned to benefit from high Asian gas prices by building LNG export terminals. Will the low price of gas in Asia crush U.S. aspirations to make Europe the primary market for its gas exports? How will climate commitments made at COP21 affect energy markets? How will the availability of Iranian oil and gas affect global markets and transatlantic relations? How can the United States and Europe stabilize and shape the future of energy? Hello and good morning again, everybody. Welcome to the session on energy. And when we talk energy, of course, we know that we talk about um, a magic triangle. And the magic triangle, of course, is that we have to have... Oh, now the mic is on. Thank you very much. <laughs> Do you want me to repeat the first stuff? Well, welcome, everybody, to the energy security panel. <laughs> um, I'm happy you're here. And um, when we talk about energy, we know also that we talk about the magic triangle. And the magic triangle, of course, is we have to ensure growth, especially in emerging countries, not only because it would be unfair and unacceptable to deny other countries in society the growth and the wealth that we enjoy, but also because non-growth, to put it that way, could lead to instability. And that's certainly something that we don't, do not look forward to, uh, especially in a world that is unstable enough um, by different factors. We, of course, have to also ensure energy security in the sense of a clever energy mix um, of different energies, but also diversification in who are our suppliers. And here, of course, I talk as a German and a European. Um, and then the last but not least thing is, of course, climate change. So we have to have an energy mix that also takes this into consideration, where we have lower emissions and um, greener energies. I'm very happy that, once again, we do have a remarkable panel lined up here. Uh, if I was in the music business, I would say the lineup is just marvelous. And I go from left to right because it's also the alphabetical order. We have Fatih Birol here, who is a regular, I was about to say, at the GMF Brussels Forum, who is the executive director of the International Energy Agency. We have Claire Rouet, who is director of Energy Cities, which is a really interesting NGO, right, um, uh, that is based on the idea uh, of smart cities and how you can make them greener and smarter. And it's about, I was about to say, the, German, the, the French word, jumelage, city uh, relationships. So finding ways is to make cities greener. We have Dov Sanyal, uh, the chief executive of Alternative Energy, and he's, I mean, I would have to read it here because you're responsible so, for so many fields within BP, from renewable to strategic too, that I ask you, you all have the GMF app, please look up his um, <laughs> CV on the app. And we're also very glad to have um, Elizabeth um, um, Elizabeth uh, Sherwood Randall here, the Deputy Secretary of Energy, somebody who's been in the Europe business for quite a bit. I mean, you've been with the Obama administration almost from the beginning. And you've been the Director of uh, European Affairs and the National Security Council. Very happy to have you here. Fatih, I would like to, to start with you. Give us a sketch about the most remarkable and most challenging developments in the energy sector these days. I mean, after all, two years ago, we probably would not have talked about low oil prices the way we do now. <coughs> Thank you very much, and uh, good morning to everybody. And uh, many thanks to uh, GMF and also my friend, uh, Doug Engel, to uh, invite me once again uh, to this meeting. Now, what is striking in the energy sector I'm almost as striking there, isn't it? So everything is uh, very interesting, very noteworthy. But there are two things perhaps I would like to highlight. One, you mentioned the drop in oil prices 
In fact, we talk about oil, but it's not only oil. Natural gas prices are also very low, and coal prices are also very low. All fossil fuel prices are very low. This is number one, perhaps the, the striking element. Number two, the big drop in the cost of renewable energies. This is also very important uh, to note for solar, wind, or, for example, efficiency, LED lighting. They are also dropping uh, uh, very strongly. So uh, a few words on the impact, perhaps likely impact, of uh, lower oil prices. Some people ask, is the good news or bad news? And the answer is, it depends on who you are. Perhaps three important implications. One, very seriously, as a result of these prices, we are seeing a big decline in oil investments. 2014, 2015, 16, we have never seen in the history of oil, two years in a row, oil investments are declining. If there was a decline one year, next year it was a, a, again a rebound. So this is very important in terms of the what will happen in the next two, three years of time. This may well put a pressure in the markets in the next few years. This is number one implication. Number two, the economies of the major oil exporting countries and even smaller oil exporting countries are being seriously challenged. We talk always about, I'm sure you will talk about Russia, Saudi Arabia and the others, but there are some other countries which we don't talk and they are facing serious problems, such as Nigeria, such as Algeria, such as Venezuela, many countries, or uh, Azerbaijan, many countries are facing serious problems, number two. Number three implication, and I, perhaps I stop here, we are seeing a major penetration of renewable energies recently. Energy efficiency is going very strongly. But lower fossil fuel prices, oil, gas, and coal, may well complicate the transition to renewable energies and energy efficiency. Because it's very cheap. The reason why we have seen major energy efficiency improvement in the last few years, one, countries are putting very strong policies, such as the US government in terms of energy efficiency, such as the European countries. But at the same time, since the energy was expensive, people wanted to save it, to keep the money in the pocket. But if the energy becomes cheap, the motivation for saving energy may be less pronounced. So therefore, lower fossil fuel prices may well complicate the energy efficiency move, as well as renewable energy transition, slow it down, even though renewables are getting cheaper, still coal is perhaps in Asia the cheapest source of energy and will stay so for a few years to come, especially given what is happening in China that the coal consumption is uh, uh, declining. To sum mm. up, two major perhaps striking developments in the energy sector, one, lower fossil fuel prices, with implications on energy security, impact on the economies of uh, 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 energy exporters, but also may well complicate the transition to clean energy technologies if the governments are not taking their job seriously, if they are not uh, alerted. I will perhaps mm -hmm. stop here. Fatih, thank you very much. I just wanted to take up on one thing, just for, for the of record, course. because Nick Gowing is sitting over here, and the conference is called um, A World Beyond Disorder. But you mentioned something that we should basically put on the record in a much clearer way. You mentioned turmoil or troubles in oil exporting countries because of you know, lesser demand, low oil prices. And you mentioned Nigeria, Angola, uh, Venezuela. So probably, you know, I mean, thinking again in the terms of thinking the, not the unthinkable because it's out there already, but the unpalatable, this is something that we should keep on the radar, right? I mean, probable, probable political turmoil in countries like that, because basically the, the political agreement of these countries doesn't work the way anymore. 
So uh, I am not able to focus about the uh, geopolitical developments, but what I can tell you is that many countries whose economies are 90, 95 percent relying on the oil, gas export revenues will have major economic difficulties, will have also challenges to make their people happy in terms of subsidies across the uh, economy, and this may well have implications beyond the uh, economy. Thanks. Perhaps I stop you. They've, we've been joking there in the back room about BP still be, being called BP. Perhaps it should be called GG, Global, Global Gas, or um, BR, British Renewables. Why is it still called British Petroleum? And does it still mean that? Do we see the end of fossil fuel age? Well, uh, Silke, thank you. Uh, I'm not a branding expert, so I don't think I'll uh, comment on the marketing elements of the brand. But I think it is important to recognize can somebody work on the mic for Dave? Because I guess we can't hear him right now. Can you try again? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Is that better? No, but you can have to uh, take the microphone in the meantime. Yeah. Is that better? Much better. Great. Um, uh, as I said, um, I'm not sure I'm a branding expert. In fact, I know I'm not a branding expert. So rather than talk about the brand, I would rather talk about uh, the primary business. The reality, of course, can you hear me now? Uh, the reality, of course, is that uh, fossils uh, do play and will play an important role uh, as we move forward in terms of economic development and economic progress. The fact of the matter is, and we don't often talk about it when we are sitting in Western Europe and indeed in developed economies, there are still 1.2 billion people without access to energy. And by the way, 400 million of those people are from my country, where I'm from, India. And if you take a step back, what that means is that they don't enjoy the things that we enjoy in developed societies. Uh, so if you're a diabetic, you probably will die because you can't refrigerate your medicine, for example. So there are some horrendous consequences of not having access to energy. I think energy and economic prosperity go hand in glove. The question I think we are faced with today is what kind of energy do we need to lubricate global development? And in that context, I believe gas is going to play an incredibly important role. Uh, what we have seen in the last few years is a growth of the gas business. Uh, as we look at the next five years, every eight weeks, there will be an LNG train commissioned. So there's a lot of gas available. And indeed, our portfolio as BP is reflecting that. Uh, today, we are sort of 50-50 oil and gas. Over the next 10 years, we'll become more like 60-40 in favor of gas. Uh, and I do believe the growth of gas is, uh, I think, an important part of the narrative. Uh, the reality, of course, is that you can't just sort of take one part of the menu. You've got to look at the entire menu. And the reality is that uh, renewables will play an incredibly important role moving forward. In fact, we see in the next 20 years renewables growing faster than either oil or gas. But I think the big transition that we need to do at this point in time is how do we grow the gas economy at the expense of coal, given the emission levels of gas are basically half of coal, and how do we continue to invest in renewables that will obviously be an important part of the mix, but when you look at it from the numbers, a 1% growth of gas at the expense of coal has the same effect as a 10% growth in renewables. So I don't think one should look at gas or renewables, it's gas and renewables uh, to drive, uh, if you will, mm -hmm. the economic prosperity narrative. Which, from what I understand, pretty much ties us to geography, right? Because, I mean, there are certain gas fields, and the not so positive part of this is tying us to uh, um, geography. We'll come to the shale gas revolution later. That it also ties us to suppliers that are sometimes a bit difficult. Um, Russia, Iran, you know, other countries. How do we deal with that, you know, when it comes to energy security? Can we, do we see also a positive supplier, um, supplier, you know, demand supply chain here, you know, between the supplier and those who are um, the buyers? Or is it something that keeps us sort of in geopolitical troubles time and again? Because this is one thing that Europe tries to do right, right now, diversify its suppliers, because Supplies only from Russia for Europe is a bit difficult these days. My own sense, uh, Silke, is that um, the narrative in the past often was around things like peak oil, around 
uh, energy security. What we've seen in the... I think the mic again is not working. Yeah. Is that uh, better? Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Um, let me try again. Uh, I feel like Frank Sinatra about <laughs> sing suit. <laughs> That's not uh, the worst. Yeah, uh, that's a good way. <laughs> trust me, you don't want to hear me singing. Um, <laughs> it, when you sort of take a step back, I've been in the business for 27 years. And when I started my career, the fashionable idea was peak oil. Uh, it, it is sort of as fashionable as the millennium bug. Uh, the idea that of peak oil has essentially peaked. There is enough supply available. Uh, the other sort of big concern was around energy security. And what we have seen with some big shocks along the way, including, of course, Fukushima quite recently, that the traded markets actually do work. So I do believe uh, one of the big developments in the last two decades, if you will, has been the nature of the traded markets, which has actually allowed for big exogenous shocks to be dealt with. So I don't believe the issue, frankly, is one of security or sufficiency. I think the bigger issue as we move forward is around sustainability, which one has to be thoughtful about in terms of one's choices. Thank you very much. Liz, um, I do remember two or three ago, years ago here at the forum, we were still discussing whether and if the United States one day would sort of export um, liquid gas or gas, you know, that comes from the shale gas revolution. And I'm asking you the simple question again, because this is a strategic decision, whether you would like to, A, export liquid gas, B, where to, because this is again about infrastructure. Is it going to be an energy pivot to Asia? Then you would have to build uh, terminals at the Pacific. Or would we also see a renewed transatlantic relationship in the energy sector? Where do we go? Oh, thanks, Selke. First of all, good morning. I have so many friends here, and it's a pleasure to be here. And thanks to the German Marshall Fund for hosting this incredibly important transatlantic dialogue every year, which brings us together around the issues that we must face uh, as allies and partners. Uh, to Silka's question, so what's really changed in the global energy landscape is American abundance of supply of both oil and gas. And that is a big difference uh, mm -hmm. that has uh, uh, happened over the course of the Obama administration. And as you noted, Silka, we are now poised to become significant exporters of both oil and natural gas. Uh, we began export of natural gas just last month. And uh, 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 we are also beginning to export oil. So with respect to energy security, the most important point is that we need to have diversity of sources. That is, our allies and partners need to have options uh, for where they get their resources from, uh, what the fuel mix is, and what the uh, pipeline routes are and the infrastructure that receives the resources. And so as you look at the decisions that have been made by the European Union over the last few years and are coming together in the G7 to set forth uh, principles of energy security in Rome in 2014 in the spring following the beginning of the Ukraine crisis, what we've really focused on together is the importance of this diversification of routes, of fuels, and of, uh, of uh, suppliers. And Europe needs principally, in order to guarantee its security, to enhance its infrastructure. So critically, the question will be, both on electricity and on uh, gas, will you have the infrastructure that you need to get the resources that are coming on to the market to where it needs to be uh, conveyed in Europe? Liz, obviously the question of infrastructure is also very important when it comes to renewables, but also yeah. um, for that, how important to you is a European energy union, which obviously is not a problem with Brussels, but rather with nation states? I mean, European energy union is very important to us because Europe is our largest trading partner, our closest allies are here, and we want to see Europe thrive. And the energy union will create the context within which Europe can make the investments that it needs to make and the decisions it needs to make on a policy basis about this diversification that I'm describing and the investments that are prioritized in the Union, uh, including on uh, the integration of the Iberian Peninsula to bring renewables to Europe, uh, to the other states of Europe, uh, bringing the Balkans, uh, uh, linking Balkan countries into the European grid, creating uh, the uh, integration of the Baltic states, which continue to have their grid facing east rather than west, uh, and the southern corridor 
gas resources coming uh, into Europe will be critical to Europe having that set of options that it needs across the, from the fossil uh, fuels to the renewables. Thanks. May I just add something sure. here to, uh, I fully agree with Lisa, and I think it's an excellent point. But the, you, your question is whether uh, U.S. shale gas will come to Europe or, or not. I, this is it an is, important point. Exactly. Thank you. This is a, a very important point that uh, is uh, underlined. But if I can come back to discussion we had a few years ago, uh, we said that U.S. shale oil revolution is a very good present for Europe. And I go one step further following the list point. Even there is no one BCM of export from U.S. to Europe, the fact that in case of a major export of gas to Europe, wants to increase the prices, your big neighbor here, or if the neighbor doesn't behave himself, the fact that there is a US LNG can come any moment, that the fact that there is an alternative there is very important cadeau present for Europe. We shouldn't forget it. It, it makes the European importers' hands much stronger compared to a few years ago. There is an alternative now. There is a US LNG that could come at reasonable prices to Europe. Therefore, it is important to highlight this uh, very important new fact. Europe has a, another potential importer of uh, gas. May I add Absolutely, one point please, to, yeah. to Fatih? So, of course, the market determines where the LNG goes. But those who decide to build the infrastructure have more leverage. So if you look at what's happened with Lithuania and the creation of the Klaipeda LNG terminal, that gave Lithuania leverage in its negotiations, and it's begun to import uh, and has had choices about mm. where it gets its supply from. Thank you. Let's for a moment also um, turn to um, the issue of renewables. Um, as a German, I can say that we've contributed to the global vocabulary quite a few words in the, over the last two years. One is Putin Fischtea, we are not going to talk about this. One is Will Commons Kultur, which probably turns into bad mood, schlechte <laughs> Laune. Um, and one is certainly Energiewende. And this is, interestingly enough, something that we don't talk that much about anymore. Somebody the other day said to me, Energiewende is like a bit like building big trains, but forgetting to build the railways. So not everything has been working out really great with the Energiewende, but the general idea to turn more to renewables and renewables making their way successfully into the energy mix um, is quite remarkable. Now, here there is, you're working on an approach that is not part of this big geostrategic, where do we have our pipelines, do we have leverage, you know, I mean, what, what, what is the geostrategic aspect of it? But you work more on a bottom-up approach, and that is making cities smarter and greener. General question, has, been, has the energy when it been helpful, or do we have to look at totally different approaches in order to get more renewables into the mix. No, I think an energy vendor is definitely the, the good approach. And it's something that we are now trying to always sell to all the other countries. Why? Because it it's doesn't look at what is possible. And you are really right to say that basically it's putting the train before the railway. It's, it's really deciding together on a national consensus of where do we want to go. Whether it is possible or not, it's not the question. The question is, where do we want to go? What is our joint ambition? And I think that's what it was interesting uh, in the energy the approach. And now, now we, 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 we see that indeed we couldn't imagine all the different developments and all the technologies that were not available when the energy vendor debate started. Almost nothing was possible. And today we know that everything is possible, or almost everything is possible. It's just that we have not yet built on the infrastructure. And indeed, LNG is, is one way of the past because we need that transition. It can't happen to, we, we can't jump from one uh, step to the other. We really need to do the pass in between. And that's what we are now having to, to, to do as a story, the storyline of the past. And that's the thing what we have not discussed. But the, the point of having a joint ambition, which is a real ambition of saying, we will completely phase out all fossil and fissile um, uh, energy 
in, in our country. I think that's the right approach to, to set on the ambition. But uh, Germany is not the only one. There is another, a lot of other countries that have done so. And now I think the Paris Agreement is also saying basically the same thing. So it's, there is a basic agreement of saying that's where we want to go. And now let's look at the different pieces of the puzzles. And LNG is a temporary piece of the puzzle, but it is a temporary one. It won't last forever because soon and sooner than, we, than what we expect. I think there is a, a very nice graph that has been published this week by the New Economic Foundation. And it's a graph which they call the peacock. Why? Because they've took all your reports for 20 years and they looked at how you thought that the, uh, the renewable would be, um, uh, the investment in renewable would be in each of the year. So, and like 20 years ago, you thought that the renewable investment were like that. And then 21 years ago, it would be like that. And it's the always, it's going like that. And now that you have, of course, a peak up, because basically it means that in 2050, today we believe that we will have a renewable investment of, uh, X, but it will always be above. Renewable mm -hmm. investment always have been above every, every forecast. We, we are too um, cautious of our own future. And I think what is great in the energy vendor, and that's what also uh, I think cities have really looked at and how they can engage into the action, is that you don't, you don't have to look at what is possible because otherwise you really limit yourself. What you need to have a look is what is your ambitious? How ambitious here do you want to be? And then you will get there. And today, all the technology is there to be completely out of fossil uh, energy, almost. The only thing that we need to do is how we do the transition and how, and that we can decide with our transatlantic partners. I'm sure that Dave is not very happy to hear that, that we are going to go out no, of the No, he said the same, more or less. <laughs> Good. But it's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to go back to Liz for a moment because, yeah, go ahead. Yeah has been said here, I would absolutely agree with. The reality is that we have to look at the transition pathway. And, and the fact of the matter is... The we have to repeat this because once again, we can't... Re I mean, I can hear you. Can you hear? Can you hear him? Okay, then go, just go ahead. Just okay. speak very loud. Loudly. Mm -hmm. All right, I'll speak very loudly. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. The point uh, I wanted to make is that the transition pathway is an incredibly important part of the narrative. In the past, there was, I would say in the last decade, an obsession with the endpoint. I think today, in this decade, we have a more intelligent debate about the means to the end. And in that context, gas is very, very important. Uh, the reality is, at some point in the future, the age of oil, the age of gas will come to an end. It's a bit like the Stone Age. It didn't come to an end because we ran out of stones. Something else came along. But I think in the meanwhile, the, the, I think the challenge for policymakers, for companies like ours, is how do we participate in that pathway? How do we ensure that we continue to have an exposure to the renewable sector? BP, by the way, has the largest exposure to the renewable sector amongst the super majors. But the gas narrative, I think, is going to be very important. It doesn't mean right. it's a narrative forever, but when we look at the next two to three or four decades, it is an important part of the overall mix. Mm -hmm. Liz, my impression is that not only do we talk about uh, diversification of supplies and sources, but also of diversification of approaches. Mm -hmm. And you could see it, if I'm not mistaken, with the Paris, um, with the Paris Agreement. Um, my reading was that we got away from a top-down, rule-based approach to climate change to let uh, give different countries um, um, the possibility to find different ways to lower their emissions and to get greener overall, but guarantee them that they find their own, uh, own ways as long as we can agree on the goal. We trust them that they find their own way. And then the second thing is also about you know, green and renewable energies and technologies. Uh, what I find interesting after Paris was that for years we've been branding China and the US as the big, big polluters, you know, I mean, the bad guys and the pollution climate change business. And all of a sudden after Paris, it was China and, and, and US who sort of were the drivers mm -hmm. um, of a politics against um, uh, tackling climate change. And I'm still wondering about this, Mr. Why, why, how did this come about? And is it just due also to different approaches to tackle climate change with different technologies and different states within the US? And I'm not only thinking of uh, California. 
um, finding their own energy vendor ways. Um, can you enlighten us on this a bit? That's lots of questions. So first, <laughs> I just wanted to say, in, back to Claire's point, in the last year, uh, the capacity for the incorporation of renewables on the American grid has exceeded the capacity expansion for natural gas. This is extraordinary that we have put more renewables onto our grid this year. And so there I would just point to the innovation that has made it possible for us to begin to deploy renewables. If you look at our solar industry, for example, it's generating jobs at a pace that exceeds most of the rest of our economy and is being deployed widely at utility scale. This was something we did not have in 2009 when President Obama came to office. So we're looking at revolutionary change in our own energy mix. And that leads me to Paris and the importance of international cooperation. So there were 20 countries that stood up in Paris on the first day of the talks and said, we're going to launch something called Mission Innovation. Because Paris has brought us to a certain point, but we have to get far beyond Paris, and that is to develop and deploy the technologies that will enable the clean energy revolution around the world. And when Dev speaks about the mix, BP is involved in the full range of capabilities from fossil to renewables. There are many countries, as he noted, that are still on a development path that will require that they use fossil fuels far into the future. So we need technologies that enable them to do that in a way that will enable the planet to survive. And at the same time, we need to drive down the cost of renewables to be able to deploy them widely as well. So 20 countries stood up and said, we will double our research and development in clean energy solutions over the course of the next five years to really advance this cause. And we identified private sector partners led by Bill Gates to match that commitment in the private sector to take the early technologies with patient private sector money and bring it to market. And that's really the critical piece to get us where we need to go over the coming years. Claire, I mean, you, yeah. you have some experiences with city partnerships where, you know, this kind of, of partnerships bring, yeah. bring, again, bring up this um, bottom-up approach. Can you tell us a bit more about that before we go for questions to the audience? Indeed, it, it, it is fascinating because it goes at to a, a, pass, a pace sorry, today uh, the change in cities where we see that everybody wants to be engaged, like in the smart city programs, we have just launched uh, a survey in our membership and everybody wants to be part of it. So it, it, we, we just cannot even cope with the, the, the appetite for innovation and for learning and how to do things. Uh, so I think, yeah, there, there, there is a major, major uh, transformation uh, today. And uh, uh, this energy vendor, just to come back indeed, what is also interesting is because you set an ambition at German level, and now that is uh, an ambition that is shared also at the global level, then it allows this innovation to happen because there, is, there has been a lot of support. I always say that. I think I'm, I am thanking the German taxpayer money because they have helped a major breakthrough in technological innovation in the renewable. Because this is because it has been supported for years, the price of renewable energy in Germany and in a number of two or three other countries, technological breakthrough have been possible that now are available for the entire world. And I, I understand that's also the path you want to take. And I, I think that's a, a great way. Claire, as a German taxpayer, wealth. I'm of course very happy about your price and that I've been <laughs> in my little way contributing so greatly you to um, some success. But, but, but allow me a bit of a skeptical question as well. And I would like to also go to, uh, put it to Dave. Um, renewables have been heavily subsidized mm -hmm. um, in Germany. And I'm not so very sure whether subsidies like that um, are really a sustainable path to make them, you know, market conform to make them. And I'd like to ask this question to Dave. Um, is this really the real way to go forward? Or is the more important stuff that a highly sophisticated economy, export oriented economy, basically had an energy open heart operation with the energy vendor and basically set a sign politically, we can do it and we want to do it and it's more about political will, but that we have to discuss more critically about the ways we get there and that the German way, I'm sorry to say, might not be um, the way to heaven. I think, uh, Silke, subsidies forever is a very bad prescription. Uh, there is no doubt about that. Uh, ultimately, what you want are market forces working mm -hmm. in a way that actually delivers the endpoint that you seek. 
if you look at the US, it's very instructive. This is a country that did not sign up for Kyoto, but emission levels mm -hmm. in the US went down to 1994 levels simply because due to, I think, a combination of factors, what I call above ground factors around innovation, around technology, around entrepreneurship, around mineral rights, etc. The shale revolution, which may sound bombastic, but it is a revolution, was created that essentially allowed America to get into a very new phase in terms of emissions. Uh, now, I think the big question for the world is, what happened to that coal that was being produced in America? Guess what had happened? It got exiled to Europe. <laughs> mm -hmm. And guess, guess, guess which country was a large Don't recipient of that <laughs> coal? Uh, uh, Germany. So I think one of the sort of, I think, lessons from America is how do you create uh, market forces that ultimately allow for rational economic decisions? In the area of renewables, for example, in the wind business in North America, where we are a large participant, uh, there is an investment tax credit and production tax credit regime. Uh, that has been very important in terms of lubricating the developments that we have seen. But frankly, what is happening in the wind business in America is that it's becoming a commercially competitive source of energy. So I think ultimately, nation states need to create market mechanisms that drive optimum commercial outcomes. I see Liz And the same has been course. true on solar. So the early government incentives for deployment of solar have now led to widespread utility scale solar deployment in the United States. And the, the market is supporting that. Thanks. May I just say something? Please, Sorry. go ahead. Yeah. I mean, we talk about Europe, uh, uh, US, it is true. But the biggest renewable move is coming from China. I am sorry to tell you that the numbers, when you look at the numbers uh, today, the renewable energy investments in China are bigger than US plus all European countries put together. Okay? China is number one in uh, solar, hydropower, <laughs> and wind in terms of capacity. This is number one. Number two, um, Europe has been years and years the champion of fighting against climate change. We have to be very frank, almost uh, two decades. But when you look at the numbers, which I think we should, last year, 2015, we have just announced uh, a few days ago, global CO2 emissions did not rise despite the global economy increased. It's a very good news. And there are two countries, main countries, main drivers of this positive development. One is China, emissions declined in China. Second is the United States. In China it is happening because coal goes down, replaced by wind, hydropower and solar. In the United States, for two reasons, one, they've mentioned shale gas replacing coal in big time and First, second reason, first, Obama administration put a lot of efficiency standards for cars and trucks. What about Europe, the champion of fighting against climate change? While the emissions declined in China and the United States, it did increase three important places in the, in the world. A, a South Asia, Middle East, and Europe. European emissions did increase last year. So we have to therefore uh, think about our policies uh, very, very uh, carefully. Okay. And perhaps uh, to finish up, to link it to the COP meeting, COP was a success, have an agreement, but the implementation is something else. Before COP, European carbon prices were nine euros per ton of CO2. And after COP, after the successful uh, agreement, you would expect the prices will go up. No, it is now less than five euros per ton. Attention. So they, therefore, with the COP, not everything is finished. Perhaps everything is starting now. We have to be very careful in Europe, continue to uh, push the 
uh, right sustainable energy uh, uh, policies and follow the good examples what is happening in China and the United States today. Thank you very much. And I believe that a year or two ago, uh, we would not have heard that on climate change that we should follow the good example of China. And yes, yeah, one of the surprises that we get here. We have plenty of questions, one here in the first row, and then we go to the second. And don't worry, I'll turn around and we have Anna Butikov for the third. So please go ahead, sir. Yeah. Mike, please to the first row here. Thanks. Just have to run around the camera. Hi, I'm Doug Hengel with the German Marshall Fund. Uh, a question to go back to oil, maybe for, for Fatih. You, you mentioned at the beginning that uh, investment in oil going down quite a bit. Um, some argue that it's a whole new oil market and prices are, you know, never going to back, go back up to where they were. Others are concerned that we're setting ourselves up for increased dependence on the Middle East because other countries will get out of uh, the, the business. And so are we setting ourselves up for a problem down the road with increased dependence on the Middle East and all that that might mean? Go Shall ahead. I? Yeah, okay. please. Now, uh, today, about 50 percent, half of the global oil exports go from Middle East. If the prices were to remain at these levels, $40, let's assume 10 more years, this 50% of reliance on Middle East will go up to 75% at least. So the world's reliance on Middle East will increase substantially if the prices were to remain at these low levels. Why? Very, very simple. It doesn't make sense in many parts of the world to produce yes. oil at $40. In Brazil, for example, in, in Africa, in shale oil in the United States. It makes only economic sense in Middle East, and many colleagues here know much better than me, the Middle East geopolitical situation may not be fixed tomorrow. That's if you take a lot of time. Of the, uh... Exactly, a lot of time. So therefore, lower oil prices may well mean the Geopolitics of Middle East and energy may be much stronger interwoven if the prices remain at these lower levels. Thank you. We have another question here in the second row. I'll have you on the list. I have a few more. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, Jonathan Taylor, European Investment Bank. Uh, I apologize for bringing up this slightly delicate subject. Apart from Dev's passing reference to Fukushima, nobody's mentioned nuclear at all, which continues to be a large part of the... Uh, energy supply. So I'd just be interested to know what people think about the role which nuclear may or may not continue to play, bearing in mind both our energy security needs and our climate change objectives. Thank you. Shall we direct this question to Liz? Yeah, right. I'll and start Claire. by saying certainly for us we view it as a very important part of the mix of clean energy resources that we need to be cultivating for the future. And for the first time in 30 years, we're building new nuclear power plants in the United States. We're also doing a lot of research on uh, advanced nuclear, on small modular uh, nuclear reactors, and, and want to work with our partners to develop and deploy those capabilities, recognizing that some countries, including Germany uh, are concerned and have decided not to build nuclear power plants for the time being, not to run the nuclear power plants that they have, but we judge that it's a very important part of, of the clean energy future. Dave and Claire also want to answer this question. Please, Claire, go ahead. Yeah, well, this week, uh, 30 mayors, uh, mainly in Luxembourg, Germany, uh, Netherlands, Belgium, uh, are, have uh, launched a call saying that they want to be associated to any decisions on new investments or in prolongation of the current uh, nuclear plants because basically those nuclear plants are based somewhere and the, the local community is usually not at all uh, in, um, involved into any kind of decision around whether it should be built, whether it should be continued and the risks uh, that are... Uh, um, um, taken by the, those communities are not taken. So they are now suing. There is a number of cities that have decided to go and sue uh, the, their own governments or the governments on the borders because typically we always say that uh, nuclear power is no, no risk, but uh, at least in this zone, all, all the, um, the nuclear power plants are always on the borders. So like uh, indeed there is always an issue where you just built on the border and then the city is in the other country so that they, they are suing the, the governments uh, in front uh, for not taking in, in consideration their 
um, their safety. And the last thing maybe is just that uh, uh, the Hungarian government is planning to do a big new nuclear plant, which is also now uh, 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 in, under scrutiny at the European Commission because there is issue of state aids and there is issue also of transparency of the deal and so on. Uh, this nuclear pl power plant would be built by Russian and with Russian, R Russian investment. But there has been uh, uh, counter studies by the Wuppertal, Wuppertal Institutes showing that indeed the, the same in, uh, with less investments and with only taking 19% of the percentage of wind power in Hungary and 13% of the, of the potential of solar power, you would get the same um, uh, energy or electricity generated than with a new nuclear plant. So it's less than 20% of the uh, wind potential and 13% of the uh, solar potential and you get the same. So it's much easier basically already today in uh, Hungary to imagine something different. Just one little question here. Um, apart from the security factor when it comes to nuclear power plants, especially in densely populated um, areas and regions, um, there's a structural problem here that concerns the energy infrastructure in general. Energy yeah. infrastructure is, to say it politically correct, aesthetically challenging. And many people just don't want to see them in that area. I mean, we, we all know about the NIMBY, NIMBY phenomenon, you know, not in my backyard. I mean, you can build it somewhere, but not with us. But still, you need this energy. So, I mean, you have to tackle this one way or the other. That if we want to have reliable, renewable, green, um, yeah. emission-friendly energy, I mean, we have to build stuff for it. Well, How do you, you tackle this? For, this is very easy. Just don't take decisions for the citizen without the citizen. So basically, you have on any new energy infrastructure to imagine a new democracy. And that's indeed one of our big campaign, energy democracy. On infrastructure, even, any infrastructure. Even it's sometimes not only about citizens, but about bureaucracy. And bureaucracy can be tedious. Do that you want to add something to that question on nuclear energy? I, I think... Uh, the point I made around the shale revolution, uh, I think, applies here as well. Above ground conditions sometimes are far more compelling than, in the case of shale, the below ground conditions. Uh, and in the case of nuclear, for a number of different reasons, the above ground conditions in many parts of the world have created obstacles for the more rapid development of nuclear. And I think when you take a step back, nuclear in the energy mix is incredibly important if indeed our objective is sustainability and lower emissions. The question is societal acceptance, i.e. above ground conditions. I think China is very, very interesting in terms of what they are doing in terms of nuclear development. Uh, and you would have seen the statistics, uh, the number of nuclear plants coming on stream literally every quarter is astonishing. When you take a step back and you're sitting in Europe, I mean, it takes years and years before any nuclear plant is commissioned. So I think we cannot ignore above ground conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think one of the challenges for policymakers and for businesses is how do we incorporate, if you will, the above ground conditions to technology and what I call broadly the below ground conditions. Thanks. I would like to collect a few uh, questions here. Rainer Bütikofer, if you'd start. And then we go here and here, and then we go into... I have you on the list. It's just let us collect three at a time, and then we go into another round, if you have the time. I know that you over European Parliament. I have two questions. One is, considering low fossil energy prices, wouldn't this be the perfect time to start implementing an ambitious strategy of reducing fossil subsidies? And second... Uh, maybe this goes to Mr. Birol. Um, how do you look at the carbon bubble risk that people like Governor Mark Carney from the Bank of England and others have been warning against? Can I take the mic and pass it on here because that's the easier way. Thanks. Your first question is directed to? Well, once you pick it up, maybe also Mr. Birol. Okay. We'll keep those in mind. Just yeah. take, let's take a second question with it. Heinrich Krefjam, Foreign Ministry. Um, I would like to, um, to ask you on uh, why, why do we have these, these low energy prices, in particularly oil and gas. Uh, one aspect hasn't been mentioned. Uh, so my question is, is there also 
a geopolitical game going on with, uh, with Saudi Arabia in the center um, trying to, um, to keep uh, prices down to hurt Iran, also maybe to hurt Russia because of Syria, and also driving, trying to drive out the fracking business uh, in the US. Uh, you mentioned uh, that uh, if prices keep low at this level, um, the um, dependency on Middle Eastern oil will grow from 50 to 75 percent. So Saudi Arabia might be trying to go back to the good old times when Saudi Arabia was in the center of oil production. Since all these questions are directed to Fatih, why don't you take <laughs> them first? So, yeah, you have to work now. I mean, um, subsidies, geopolitical um, developments. Just a second. I work all the time, including Saturdays, by the way. So this is, uh, <laughs> we obviously do, yeah. <laughs> yes. So uh, first of all, starting from the low, uh, why do we have low uh, prices? In terms of oil, uh, there are uh, three reasons. One, the big success of uh, shale oil in the United States. Huge amount of oil uh, came in the markets. Very good news. And at the same time, Iraq brought a lot of oil uh, to, to the market. So we have a lot of supply. And the third reason is something that we don't discuss a lot, but it's extremely important. Namely, global oil demand growth slowed down because of we use cars and trucks and jets much more efficiently now compared to in the past. So demand slowed down. And a lot of supply, a lot of production is there. Therefore, downward pressure on the prices. But our expectation is latest by 2017, latest, we will see a rebound of the prices. But it may not go up substantially in, in, as in the past, because if it comes to a certain level, US shale oil will come back again. Currently, US shale oil is going down because of the it doesn't make economic sense with $40. But if it goes against $60, $70, it will come back and it will put a cap on the increase of the prices. Of course, in the absence of any deliberate policies of the producers or a geopolitical development and so on. This is number one. But once again, I wanted to highlight here that it is not only oil prices low, but natural gas prices are also very low. In the US, less than $2. In Asia, it was, uh, Dave knows uh, much better than me, 14 months ago, LNG prices were $20. It is less than $5 now. Big drop. Coal is the same, and this is very important. I wouldn't underestimate the competitiveness of coal in Asia. It is less than $50. So we have low oil prices, and as uh, uh, the, uh, our, our parliamentarian colleague uh, said, this could be a very good opportunity to reduce the fossil fuel subsidies. And some countries do it. Uh, India, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand made some uh, efforts. Saudi Arabia also reduced the subsidies. But there is still huge amount of fossil fuel subsidies. So, uh, you mentioned uh, the uh, renewable subsidies. But I can tell you that the fossil fuel subsidies today are five times higher than the renewable subsidies uh, 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 we have. Talking about disturbing the market, huh? Exactly. And this is make if something is cheap, which is uh, the, uh, the coal, gas, and oil, people uh, go for it. And it makes the life for competing fuels, alternative fuels, very difficult because they are very cheap, the fossil fuel subsidies. So uh, another question is the result of uh, this, uh, uh, the uh, low oil prices uh, policies of deliberate policies of some countries, I think so. Uh, the very fact that the producers uh, didn't uh, want to cut their production and let the prices be low uh, end up uh, with the, a cut in the oil production high cost areas, such as the US, uh, Brazil, and Africa. And it seems that their policy is going in the direction that uh, they wanted to uh, uh, see. So these are some of the answers to the questions. We won't forget this, can, the geopolitical can, question about Saudi Arabia. We have, have about 100 more questions in the audience. Can I just and say Liz one and thing? Dave wanted to just quickly remark yeah, on that. Very quick, to add to what Fatih said, it's quite interesting that in addition to what you already described about our 
uh, capability that has come online. Because prices have gone down, we have also seen that our oil companies have uh, been driven to increased operational efficiencies. Yes. So people say low, low, oil, low oil prices are bad for production. Actually, it's created incentives to do it more efficiently. And so we've been able to keep production up. Yes. That's an interesting counterfactual. I, I mean, Silke, uh, I agree with, with what uh, Fatih Bey has said. Uh, but why don't you just take a step back here? Over the course of the last 16 months, there's been a $2 trillion shift of rent between producers and consumers. That is circa 2.3% of world GDP. This is a profound change that has taken place. And the question for consuming nations is, what do you do with this, if I may use a corporate term, special dividend? In the case of India, in the case of Indonesia, they've removed subsidies to a large extent. Other countries have sought to bolster their budgets. Other countries have sought to invest in new technologies. So there are some big, profound changes for consumer nations. We've spoken a bit about the producer nations and the stresses that we are seeing. But I think there is another very important story about what consuming nations are doing as they've received the special dividend, if you will. Yeah, thank you for that input. Um, Fatih, can you just quickly also answer the question on Saudi Arabia and the geopolitical aspects? I think, as I said, in general, uh, some uh, producing countries uh, who can uh, produce oil at a cheap level, at a low cost level, wanted to see that the prices should be like that for some uh, time to come, so that uh, the share of the high cost countries go down, such as, again, Brazil, US, Canada, and others. And it seems that currently uh, their policies uh, seem to be uh, working. Thanks. We have one more question here. And then we collect, and we go to you, and then we go over here. Yeah. Uh, my name is Hari Haran. This is a question for Liz. Liz, what does a strategic petroleum reserve mean? What does a strategic petroleum reserve mean in today's America? We are swimming in oil. We have a billion barrels of oil in a place where it's difficult to get it to where it needs to go. Why are we locking up $50 billion in the ground? Thanks. Do you want to answer I'll, this I'll question right, I right away? I thought you were in a group question, so I'll hold on to that. Thanks. Uh, Trudy Rubin, the Philadelphia Inquirer. A couple of geopolitical questions. Um, could anyone speak to the issue a little bit more about current and future European dependence on Russian energy sources. Uh, where is that now and where is that going? And also, what is the impact of uh, the removal of sanctions on Iran? Uh, what impact is that having on the energy markets? Well, that's a big question. <laughs> and we take one more and then we go over here. Good morning, my name is Lawrence Jones. I'm with the Edison Electric Institute. I got two questions. Uh, the first question is for Claire. Uh, we've seen in the U.S. when you've had uh, uh, disruption in the electricity markets as a result of extreme weather events like the polar vortex, uh, capacity markets have to be redesigned. And as we look at Europe, can you comment on the capacity market situation? You've talked about nuclear. I think nuclear is an important part of making sure we have the base load necessary for sustaining a long-term energy supply. So can you just comment on how the U European electricity uh, capacity markets are evolving? And then I think for Liz, um, you know, you brought up this issue of uh, the investments being coming in from the, uh, the, millions, uh, invest the billions of dollars coming. Uh, as we look at the evolution of electricity grid, we see both centralized and decentralized playing a role. But for utility scale solutions to scale, uh, the issue of uh, permitting is, is a big one. And, and infrastructure being built in the US, for example, getting wind from Kansas into the, the, the load pockets. So can you comment on what should be done to sort of open up the field for building more infrastructure for, uh, for uh, expanding utility scale solutions? Thank you. Can I make a suggestion? Do you mind if we skip the second question? Because we have two more here. <laughs> and that's, you know, that's a really big question as well. Can we have just Sure, answer you one? can skip anything you want to do. You're the <laughs> boss. <laughs> I just want to give a fair, fair uh, chance to this part of the room to also ask some questions. So um, Liz, would you answer the first question? Of the on, the, on the SPR, yes. So uh, you, when you think about energy security, you need to take a long-term view. And indeed, right now, we're in a moment of abundance, and the market is flush. But you can't assume that forever. And so 
uh, our commitment is to maintain a certain reserve that is available to us and to also our allies and partners around the world in the event of some kind of shock or uh, supply constraint that would endanger us or someone, a country that uh, we want to support. And of course, in, in membership in the International Energy Agency, which Fatih leads, we all have made commitments to a certain amount of stockholding, which is a very important principle of creating the energy security that we uh, sought to establish following the shocks in the 1970s. Thanks. Fatih, May I add something to sure. here? I mean, just to, I mean, Liz gave an excellent answer, but just to tell you that it will be a grave mistake to link our attention to oil security uh, to changes in the oil prices. The lower the oil prices, we think energy security is not important. Oil prices go up, energy security is very important. Energy security is an extremely important business. Europeans experience that. The entire world experienced it, and when we look at the geopolitical situation today, many of the questions around that, what is happening today in Iraq, in, in Libya, Syria, the problems between Russia, uh, Ukraine, I think uh, we should be all thankful to those countries who have their uh, oil securities in stock, uh, uh, led by United States, Japan, and other countries. Thank you. Would you also give a quick sketch on the geopolitical implications or energy dependency on countries like Russia and Iran? Where are we here? I mean, in terms of uh, uh, Russia, as I just mentioned, it is very important for uh, Europe to diversify its energy imports. And uh, I know that the, the energy union, the, uh, if you uh, mention the energy event, there is a German word in the, in the uh, English language. Now, there's another one. The zeitgeist <laughs> is today the diversification. <laughs> and here, uh, the diversification is uh, very important. And once again, the uh, Europe trying to get uh, oil and gas from the, uh, some Caspian countries, from Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan, plus uh, uh, US Canadian gas uh, uh, coming in the picture, making more use of them would be the best way to diversify the portfolio and reduce the reliance on one single strong uh, exporter. So therefore, it is very important. In terms of Iran, we still have to wait and see whether Iran will be able to attract substantial amount of investment for the capacity expansion and technology access, to have the reserves as something, to produce out of them as something else. And just to remind all of, all of us one fact, geological fact, the Iranian geology of the fields are much more complex compared to many Gulf countries. So it mm -hmm. is a lot of sophisticated technology to get the oil out of the uh, system. Of course, we expect that Iran can make in the next few months 500, 6,000 barrels per day in additional production. But the biggest growth needs a lot of investment and technology coming in the country, which uh, remains to be seen. Thank you. We have five minutes, more minutes left. So either we have to talk really, really fast. But Claire, take, take the question uh, of this gentleman. Or we um, might yeah. have, I apologize already, might have to skip um, further questions. But we'll see how we get there. Okay, no, I, I will be very short because indeed capacity um, market is asked to be redesigned and it's in the process now. And it's just for me, it's, it's the core of the energy union because it's how to redesign solidarity between member states when before we had national energy systems and that they have to be now completely decentralized so that the capacity market redesign has to be built onto the potential that you have at local level. Okay. That's the shortest suggestion. Second. You go ahead here, but I want, I want you to also take two minutes' time until before we stop um, to take up one of Nick Gowing's questions that he had introduced yesterday. Uh, I know the energy market, he's left, but he'll, he'll hear. Oh, okay. um, the energy market is probably much more understandable because it's about infrastructure, investment, in, 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 uh, etc. But I really would like you to think about. Is there something out there which might surprise us when it comes to energy markets or the energy sector? Is there something that we don't have on the radar which could basically surprise us, put us in troubles, or whatever? Would be great if you could think of this. But now we go to this question. Teresa. Hello, Teresa Fallon, European Institute for Asian Studies. I would like to follow up on Dev Sanyal's comment about how fast nuclear is being built in China. Recently in Guangzhou, uh, not one, but two nuclear sites were shut down due to security concerns. 
and in China, so the Chinese government is shutting them down. So now we see Hinkley Point Project in the UK, which is a joint project between Arriva and a Chinese state-owned enterprise with unproven designs uh, running into some problems. Uh, have, there, there have been many cost overruns in Europe, which I think you were referring to, and over budget and uh, very late in schedules. So how do we see future of nuclear in Europe and policy making? Because um, with such low energy prices, we, have we really calculated the real price of nuclear in Europe, which includes reprocessing spent nuclear fuel and also um, decommissioning aging nuclear plants? Thanks. Thanks. Pass it on to Eckhart. Yeah, thank you. My question goes, Eckhart from Clayton Daimler AG. My question goes to Claire about this uh, idea of energy democracy. And my experience is that, the, uh, ironically, the acceptance of nuclear power plants rises if you come closer to the muni municipalities where they are located. And the reason is the uh, power plants uh, provide Generates the municipalities with jobs and yeah. uh, taxes. Yeah. And this is especially the, 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 the concern or the problem with uh, renewables, uh, especially with grids, because they are more or less jobless and taxless. And I think you can raise the acceptance of it if you find a way to benefit to, uh, to make the people benefiting from the infrastructure. Uh, so and, and I just ask you whether the there are the some key, ideas on yeah. that. So, and Teresa's question was addressed to? To? Oh, Dev. Okay. Claire and Dev. And we have three minutes left. And no, we'll indeed, finish I, I here I the 10-15 yeah. chart. <laughs> I would answer also very shortly. I think that sharing the wealth, or at least having a, 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 a conversation on who is getting the wealth of the infrastructure, of the energy produced, to, th this is the key, and this is what we have now to discuss to imagine the path of the energy transition. Super Dev? short. A very short answer is essentially safeguards have to be created, not just for nuclear, but for any kind of energy. And social acceptance is going to be important. Uh, you only have to look at some of the tensions around Arctic development, which would tell you that the social narrative, the security narrative, will remain very, very important as one looks at new options. Liz? I, I just want to answer your question about surprises. I mean, we can think of all sorts of uh, negative surprises, shocks, and we've talked about the importance of energy security. Uh, and the actions that we need to take collectively. But there's also a very positive uh, potential, and that is this the revolutionary potential of the research and development that will be undertaken by our universities, our laboratories, the brains of the future who will be innovating to enable us to reach our goals on the climate front and power the people, as you described, Deb, hundreds of millions of people who need electricity for their lives. So I actually am quite optimistic. I think there is so much out there to be discovered that will change our energy future. And we all need to be contributing to that and encouraging our young, pe young people to get strong STEM educations and go out and discover new things. Gosh, what can I say? At a conference where we talk about the world beyond disorder, we get such an optimistic approach. As well, <laughs> there is thinkable, something thinkable out there that could protect us from the surprises and from the bums on the road in the energy sector, sector and that's our own thinking and our imagination and creativity. Thank you so much. Um, for this discussion, and thank you, audience, um, for all your questions. And I apologize to those who didn't have the time to ask their questions. Thank you very much. Nick. Thank you very much, Silke. And uh, don't go oh, uh, for three. Thank you very much, Silke, and thank you very much to the panel. Um, we're just going to have a quick reflection, as we said we would at various points between now and tomorrow lunchtime with Robert. Um, about whether we're moving to create some kind of continuum here, Robert, whether we really have defined the world beyond disorder. Is that the right title? Um, I'm not so sure, because I think it, we, uh, Margaret McMillan warned us to be against smugness. But to assume that there is a world beyond disorder is itself sort of smug. Um, because first we have to define what the disorder is, what, why it's arisen, and where it's going. First of all, where it's going, we've already seen and, and kind of factored in the collapse and weakening of small and medium-sized states in Africa and the Middle East. But 
but I think what we have to look forward to is the weakening of bigger states themselves, whether it's Nigeria or especially China and Russia, whose economies are in very troubled states and whose internal situations are more and more complex. And I think what's causing all this is, for the first time in history, we live in a post-imperial moment. Remember, the Habsburg and Ottoman empires and Prussian empires collapsed after World War I. After, war, after World War II, the, uh, the British and French empires started to unravel slowly. After the Cold War, the Soviet empire collapsed, and the United States is not the superpower that it was. So we're in a world beyond imperialism, and imperialism gave order to vast multi-ethnic swaths of the world. And imperialism may be bad, but if not imperialism, what, what, what then? And what then is what we've been trying to do is, an, is a rules-based international order of organizations um, that, re, you know, that replace imperialism, but it's unclear that it's working. Last thought at this point before coffee. Do you think there's a mood here, picking up what Margaret Macmillan said yesterday, of confronting the scale of disorder, of gripping the enormity of the new normal, however it's defined? I think there is in this hall, in this audience. But again, what the decisions are made by politicians who are loyal only to the publics who voted for them. So again, they know what they need to do intellectually, but they often ha have a hard time finding the political will to actually do it. But do you sense a level of discomfort almost that the reality is are really quite difficult to cope with. At the yes, moment. and discomfort is the first step on the way to escaping smugness. All right, well, we'll be back before we have Donald Tusk this evening to give a further reflection. This is our view. Hopefully, it stimulates you to think uh, beyond where we're at at the moment. So go and enjoy your coffee and back in about 25 minutes.